Just a quick um, preface here. They've only given me about three hours to. Actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take what God did in this amount and prune it down to just that much. New Covenant's good, isn't it? Now, you know, the main thing, Brother um, Mike disclosed it there, is that in the end, that we can appear before him, before his presence, faultless. The um, text is Jude one twenty four. says, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless, faultless, before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Success. Mission successful, Father. I, I, I completed your mission. You sent me to receive many sons. Successful mission. Well, this is quite a project, you'll have to admit. Um, to pre in order for him to present you faultless, see that, that's, now you know you. How, how big of a mission was it for him to be able to present you faultless without blame, without even one blemish, without one fault whatsoever, no spots, unblameable, unreprovable, which means that no one in heaven or no one in hell could come into the presence of the Father and point his finger and say, you missed something. And you, do, do, you, do you think for a second that that wouldn't happen? Oh, he'd be right there, wouldn't he? You know this one because he's right there right now, isn't he? He's pointing them out to you right now because he can't point them out to the Father anymore. Amen. Why? Because you are faultless. You are without blame. Well, how is he going to do this? How is this great God of glory going to accomplish this high and noble purpose, this work? Well, it's going to require 100% of his activity. That's what it's going to require. No less. Couldn't be 90%. God had to, had to be involved in the work the whole way. And he is. We're going to see that. It require a cost greater than, than man can ever perceive. It's going to require a cost now. God can't wink at sin. It's going, to, it's going to have to be worked out in the presence of principalities and powers. God's not going to be able to do this in the dark. It's going to be worked out in all those that are in, in glory, the 24 elders and the living creatures and and all the angels round about that saw some of theirs, or how God reacted to some of theirs that fell, how's he going to do this and remain just? He must be true to his person in bringing men back to glory. He cannot violate himself. And another way to say that, he will not violate himself. And he will not violate those who are made in his image. He won't do it. In other words, he's not dragging anyone to glory. Another aspect of it, there won't be anybody that awakes with his likeness, faultless, that's surprised. It's not going to happen. It's not going to be like, how did I get here? No. Anyone who thinks that salvation is an easy work really hasn't seen the extent of the fall. He hasn't really seen how far dead is. Well, let's see what God had to work with. What did he have to work with? Dead people. Well, now, see, God can get to work, can he? See, now, it's, this is a noble work, isn't it? This is a work that would require divine 
presence, divine activity, one who's able to do exceeding abundantly above what we think to ask. Well, this is his plan now. His, his, his purpose is, Revelation 14, 5, and in their mouth was found no guile, no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Now, I, 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 I'm going to surmise here that you put those two things together. Without fault is one thing, but before the throne of God. Now, now you've come something that's absolutely 100% impossible with man. Can't be done. But with God, all things are possible. All things. He's starting with the race of people that are dead. He said, wherefore, Romans 5, 12, well, for, wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men. You got it, whether you liked it or not. Whether you wanted it or not, you got it. Adam gave it to you. It was imputed to you, wasn't it? You were born with this problem. This isn't something that you could, you could do anything about. In another sense, it was something that you didn't want to do anything about. See, this was your nature. This is who you were. You were dead in trespasses and sins. Well, Jesus talked about it. There wasn't anybody. There isn't none that does, that does righteous. There's not any who seek, seek after God. None. So this is what he had to work with. A bunch of uninvolved people who didn't think they needed God to begin with. How's he going to get them interested? Well, I'm just going to nail this down for a second. This, the fact that you, I know this is awfully personal, isn't it? Are a sinner. Now in Genesis 3, 6, it says, When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to, make, to, to, to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and gave it to her husband also with her, and he did eat. And what happened? The eyes of them both were opened. They were open. They, they could see. So, so, well, I guess the serpent really told them the truth, didn't he? They could see. Well, what could they see? That they were naked. It became very evident that they were dead. They were real quick to try to work on the problem. They went and they sewed some fig leaves together. This, this is our own building project now. We're going to try to make ourselves acceptable. Get these fig leaves together. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. All of a sudden... It starts to become very apparent that their labors weren't paying off here. They just heard the voice now. This is just a voice. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord amongst the trees of the garden. They knew they were not accepted. They knew that they couldn't come into his presence. They were feeling uncomfortable. Now, this is what he passed on to us. You ever noticed that? Before, you, before faith came, you were uncomfortable in God's presence. And you were uncomfortable in God's people's presence. You come around someone that was close to God, you were uncomfortable. That's Adam. That's what I'm talking about. And God called Adam and said, Where art thou? This was not acceptable. This was not acceptable. God made them to fellowship with them. God made them that he, that he could fellowship, that he could share himself. He created a personality that could appreciate him. Oh, we, we've been brought to a place in Christ where we can actually fellowship with God. Oh, this is, this is a high, exalted place. Much higher than what Adam had well, people who hide themselves from the voice of God are not going to feel very comfortable in the very presence. 
before his throne? Oh, they would run, wouldn't they? They'd run, they'd cry for the rocks and the mountains to, to fall on them and destroy them, but no. Romans 3.23 nails this down and says, all have sinned. You see, there comes a time when you can't blame it on Adam anymore, isn't it? You got to take the blame for yourself. You got to say, I'm the one. I'm the one that I don't want to do right. My nature is, I have this vile body that wants to do vile things. Paul said, oh, wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me? Well, we can say, praise God. We know the answer to that question. This is obviously a work that God's going to have to do. This is a work. If you're going to be found faultless in his presence and it results in any kind of joy, well, this is obvious. God's not going to rely on man to do this, is he? He's not going to do it. What kind of a resource? Look, just look at all the things here in Jeremiah 10, 23. It says, Oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. Yeah. If you, remember the day you came to that realization yeah, that I can't do it. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. I see the ironic thing is we're the one who have to do the walking. God's not going to do the walking for you, but he wants to direct your steps. There is a way that seems right unto man, but the end thereof is death. That's where it will lead you. You want to follow in your own path. Death is waiting. There is not a just man upon the earth. Now, I'm not making this up. That doeth good and sinneth not. I know it is, of, it is so of a truth. I know it because I know me. But how should man be just with God? What a, this is the, 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 the thriving question upon those that would want to, 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 to have any kind of aspiration towards God. How am I going to be just in his presence? Mm -hmm. Amen. This is consuming to anyone who's ever had a desire to come up higher. Shall mortal man be more just than God? Oh, see, this is God's not going to leave this up to us. He really isn't. Shall a man be more pure than his maker? Now, see, it says, Behold, he putteth no trust in his servants. Isn't that good? Isn't that good? How would, how would you like it if God laid it all on your lap and said, you, you better work it out now? Well, wait a minute. Isn't that what God kind of did with the law? See, it's, it, the problem is, is that man kind of thinks he can do it. This is the problem. This is what God had to work with. God had to overcome this problem with man. You think, I can do pretty good on my own. I think I'm, I'm pretty good. You know, I mean, there is no law, so I don't really have any sin. God comes along and he lays it all out. He says, no, now I know I can really do good. Yeah, I got, to, now he's told me what he expects of me. So now I'll just go ahead and I'll just go ahead and, and do what God wants. And then I'll, I'll be able to stand in his presence and I'll got to owe me. Well, what do you think of that? Anyone that's ever tried to do it. See, this is a road that God plowed now. This is a road that, that, that God made for man to go down. He gave us a law. He called it a schoolmaster. You see, uh, he, he knew it was going to teach us something. Paul said, I was alive without the law once. Once. But when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. Now, this is a... This is the result of an honest heart right. trying to work out his own salvation. Taking the law, taking it seriously, taking God serious. God said, if you can do it, you'll, you'll be righteous. He'll receive you if you can do it now. So he, he lays out the commandments and Paul takes him serious. He says, he, he lays out all the things, all that, you know, he was a Hebrew, the Hebrews, he's a Pharisee, the Pharisees, he, this man lived it. In fact, if you were on the outside of Paul, you'd have said, 
that is a righteous man. You would have surmised he is a righteous man. He had the appearance. But see, he was honest. He saw this. Is, it smote him in his heart, didn't he? He died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taken occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and it by it slew me. Well, I wasn't, I didn't find myself faultless in his presence. But the bottom line, he says, Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear. Ah, now we're getting to the heart of why God gave the law. So that sin would appear to be what it really is. Because see, man, he, he, he's, he's going to walk off all kinds of different roads. He's going to find himself in all kinds of different locations. God wanted him to find this one particular path. The path that would lead to knowing that he needed Christ Jesus. Working death in me, it worked death in him. God wanted to work life in him. Well, sin became exceeding sinful. Now, only God could do this. You know, see, man, when he comes up with laws and ordinances, they're never really strong enough to do anything, right? I mean, you can pretty much think you're doing pretty good, but it was even God. He, he starts with number one. You get past that one. The other nine just fall right into place. But see, the problem is we just can't get past number one. You can't love him with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. Not in the flesh you can't. Why did he give the law then? He says that every, Romans 3.19, that every mouth might be stopped. Flesh is not going to glory in his presence. No flesh is going to be there on that day. Well, see, this is a fact. And whether or not he gave, he gave the law, whether or not he sent Christ, whether or not he redeemed us, whether or not we were accepted in him, there's going to come a time when we're going to stand before God with no flesh. It's a, it's a reality. It's going to happen. Amen. Now, you see how, grace, grace, how graceful God is and how merciful God is. And that he's brought us to this place where we can see right now, I need a Savior. I need to be saved because I'm going to come before the face of God and I'm going to be, whoa, I'm going to be lacking. I'm going to be found faultful. I'm going to be found, he's going to have to cast me out of his presence. Well, God had a dilemma. God had to get rid of sin. If he was going to bring many sons to glory, if he was going to, we were going to be found faultless, sin had to be dealt with. And he couldn't just speak it away, could he? He couldn't just say, go away, sin. Just go away. You know, sometimes you may have infirmities, and God can just do that. He can just, just speak a word, and just, it just go away. You just be all right. He can just heal you just with a word, just like that. Couldn't take sin away like that. Couldn't do it. You got the principalities and powers standing right there watching him, scrutinizing every move. What is God doing having dealings with sinful men? From the time that Adam fell to the time that Jesus died on the cross, he all, they're watching him. They're watching him. What's he doing? What's he doing? He's, he's having dealings with sinful men. But see, he was, Jesus was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Before Adam ever sinned, Jesus was going to come and was going to take away the sin of the world. This is something that God had planned. It says this was nothing, no surprise to God when Adam gave in to sin. This was no surprise whatsoever. This was so that God could show his mercy. He could reveal who he is. Amen. See, principalities and powers never seen this before. Angels never seen God be merciful before. When the angels fell, they were summarily cast out of heaven, out of his presence. Why? Because they sinned. They did something that they weren't supposed to do. Sin, that's what, missing the mark. So you can see there in the garden, Satan was like on the edge of his toes there like this. Any moment he's going to cast him out of the garden. Any moment now he's going to crush him. I remember what he did to us. 
Any moment now, what's God do? He comes down, he says, I'm going to crush your head. It's going to cost me. It's going to bruise my heel, but I'm going to crush your head. Shouldn't have done that. See, he said he hath made him to be sin for us. See, there come a time when Jesus came to the earth and he was given a body. He was given a body that was under the law. One that could keep the law. One that could be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. One that could know exactly what it's like for to be tempted with sin. He could struggle. And he could never give in. He could always do those things to please the Father. And there came a time when surely he bore our griefs. There on the cross, God turned and he took the weight of sin. And he took it and he laid it on the shoulders of the one who always had pleased him. The one who has always had did those things that made him happy. All those things that brought him joy. He said, this is my man. This is my fellow. Awake, O oh sword. I'm going to cut him off. Out of the land of the living. Just for a brief moment. And it shall come to pass that in all the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. And I will bring the third part through the fire. You feel sometimes that you're being brought through a fire? Feel like sometimes you've been pressed beyond measure? Jesus, he took the weight. You just got what was left over. You're just following, you're just fellowshipping with him in his suffering. That's all you're doing. You wouldn't know what Jesus went through if he didn't have to go through this. You'd have no idea. But now you know he's sharing this with you. You can fellowship with him. You ever, you ever resisted sin? Sin ever tried to drag you away and you said, no, no. I want to be found faultless before him on that day. Yeah. Why has that got to be that way? You got to fellowship with him in his sufferings. He took away your sin. He fellowshiped with you in that, didn't he? This is the one that knew no sin. He knew no sin. And God made him to be sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God. We might be faultless before his presence. See, that? remember now every day you wake up, every day you deal with this thing that you inherited sin from Adam. You inherited this nature. Well, now God said, you believe the record that I gave of his son, and I will impute unto you the righteousness of God. I'll do that. You say, well, I don't understand that. Well, it ain't no different than what happened in Adam. No, different, no difference at all. None. You got that. And see, God just wants to give you the righteousness of himself. Do you believe the record? I, I, I laid your sin on my son. Sin's not an issue anymore. Fact is, do you believe I did it? Do you believe? Well, now, if you believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. For Christ also hath suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. Now, you can be faultless before him in his presence because Jesus was with fault. This is why, see, it had to go somewhere. It couldn't just go nowhere. So God had to lay the fault on Jesus. Yeah. Now you can stand before him, no fault. Amen. And God could give you his own righteousness. See, God said, I'm not going to share my glory with another. So you can't stand before him in your own righteousness. It just can't happen. Now, Paul knew this. Paul knew it. He said, I don't want to stand before him in my own righteousness, which is of the law. Now, I kind of put that in my own words, but you get the point. Paul was interested in the righteousness of God more than he was interested in his own righteousness. Amen. Now, see, this is the only way. This is the only way that you're going to be found acceptable on that day. 
You cannot be standing in your own righteousness. You, not even a little bit of it. You see, Paul, Paul said that he counted all things loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. See, that, that he might be found in him. Amen. Not found in his own righteousness. Not even a little bit of it. See, this, uh, he says, you know, the, the little foxes there, they spoil the vine. This um, little bit of leaven, it, it's just going to waste the whole lump. See, now, I can remember thinking, I did really good this week. God must really love me this week. See, that's, what, that's, that's just a little bit of leaven, isn't it? You can't, that is, how can you stand before God by, by what you've done? Well, he says, not having my own righteousness. See, there, we do have righteousness, don't we? We do. But you don't want to stand before God in that. Yeah. Yeah. How far is that going to go with God? We want his righteousness. And he said, I want to give it to you. I, for what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. We say, glory to God. Amen. The flesh has got to go. Wake up in the morning, look in the mirror and say, you're going to die today. I targeted you for death another day. You think you're going to get away with anything today? I picked you out of the crowd. See, you, there's no law against this. I can do this. See, this one that I see in the mirror has done me much harm. Tried to stand in the way of me gaining glory. Why did he do that? Why did he put sin on Christ? That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Remember, he promised if you could do it, you could have the life in it. Well, now, see, Christ did it. He 100% fulfilled the law. He made it honorable. And now, God can take that and put it to your account. And now, when you stand before him, you're faultless. Faultless. Without fault. Ooh. Now, there's all kinds of provisions, but I'm not going to deal with them. I'm just going to leave you with this, that you're faultless. I see that that's a, for another message, for another time. I'm not going to take the power out of this because the, the fact is, is that Jesus, it died and rose from the dead. So you could be faultless. Amen. That's what he did. Amen. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That's what he did. He accomplished it, you see. We're not talking about something that may happen. Something that is possible to happen. Jesus Christ died for your sins. And rose again for your justification. Amen. That he might present it to himself. A glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. That's what you are. This is what you are right now. In the body of his flesh. His flesh, not your flesh. His flesh. God laid it on his flesh. And he died through death to present you holy. God would have to deny his own son's death to deny you faultlessness. This is, a, I'm serious. This is the truth. On that day, when you stand before him, he's going to look at you. He's going to say, thou art all fair, my love. Thou art all fair. The price was worth it. When I turned, as it were, my face from my son, it was worth the cost. Because there is no spot in thee at all. He looks at you now and he says, I don't see any transgression in Jacob. I don't see any sin. So when the wicked one comes and he tries to convince you of some sin, 
You say, we are the workmanship of God. We are God's work. And on that day, he's going to glory over you. He's going to rejoice over you with singing. Now unto him that is able to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God who is our Savior. Be glory and majesty and dominion and power both now and forever. Amen.